Hi, um, I'm Sydney. I run the Diagnostics Development Hub or DXD Hub. DXD Hub is a national platform of Singapore for the purpose of uh, uh, diagnostics um, productization. It is funded by the National Research Foundation of Singapore and hosted by ASTAR. ASTAR is Agency for Science, Technology and Research of Singapore. So the title of my talk today is Anatomy of Diagnostics Tests. So I will start by going through uh, the process of product development of a diagnostics test. So if you look at this uh, uh, value chain of what it takes from the lab to the market, we always start from the discovery, of course, and it goes through the translation and then this process that we call productization. Uh, most of us actually um, have heard about uh, this process being referred to as product development. And the, the, we like to call it productization just to differentiate that a little bit from translation. Um, and then, of course, uh, market adoption um, towards the end. Um, what DXD Hub uh, has built and has been focusing on is really this segment we call productization and market adoption. And that is actually linking the output of R&D to the market adoption, which is uh, most of the time the end users would be the, the operator in the clinical diagnostics labs or the clinicians directly. And when we talk about R&D output on the, on the one end of the, the value chain where the translation is, we are really referring to the R&D output. And whether the R&D output is coming from a company or it is coming from a public sector, and these are the outputs that DXC Hub will work with to take them downstream and do the development and connect that to the end users. What goes on in between is this uh, V-shape that you see um, at the bottom of productization and market adoption. We always start from the user requirement. It's always what does the product look like when we actually take it out to the market? How, how is the product going to be used? So we're not talking about a snapshot of a test. It's really, um, and therefore we call it the anatomy of a diagnostics test because it involves the whole workflow, not just a snapshot of a, a component. So we focus on these two elements in the red line box, the end-to-end -end productization and the agile process. So end-to-end -end productization basically means that we start with the end in mind. We actually go out and look at the usability and talk to the users and see what the product should look like. And then we go back to the beginning of the productization. So you can see in those boxes at the beginning of the productization, it actually says a functional prototype. So functional prototype is not just the, the prototype itself. It's how it actually works as a functional uh, unit um, and the systems integration. So it's very important to know how, for example, in the diagnostics assay, how the assay works in uh, whichever system. And you need to be able to integrate that on a certain platform, on a certain system. That's why we call it system integration. And that's why we call it functional prototype. So we start with that. And then we actually do the verification of that whole function sitting in the system. And before, so all that will be done before we go down to clinical validation. So we always like to advise uh, our partners that we need to be able to understand as much analytical function and performance of the product as possible before we go down to clinical validation. So what do we mean by the anatomy of diagnostics tests? If you look at this, when we talk about diagnostics tests, it's never about the assay. Assay is really one of the components of a diagnostics test. The diagnostics test actually starts from when the specimen is collected, because you always need to consider what are you testing? Are you testing blood, saliva, or um, a nasal pharyngeal um, specimen. So those are all very important part of the consideration when you think about a diagnostics test. So we always start with what is the sample type? What specimen are we using? And then we think about um, the, the test, the assay itself. 
uh, are we looking at um, assay that will be detecting nucleic acid, or we are looking at assay that will be detecting uh, proteins? After we consider what si what type of assay that we're looking at, um, depending on what analytes we are going to be detecting. Uh, we then need to think about what system the assay is going to be running on. Is it going to be running on? If, if it is a PCR assay, uh, there are so many different types of PCR platforms on the market. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel and you know build a PCR um, system. Uh, which type of the commercial PCR system you uh, want to run your assay on? And it can be all of them. But every time you use one specific system is is a diff is a whole new process of um, analytically verifying the performance of your assay on that specific system. So that's why we always talk about everything uh, as a whole rather than just the test itself, just the assay itself. We need to think about uh, if it is a lab-based test, what is the system the lab is using? Is are we are we looking at a high throughput type test every time? Uh, the lab is going to be running 96 samples in a row, or the lab is a, a low to mid throughput uh, type labs where each time they only need to run 10 and they can go. Uh, it, it's important to consider that because it's a huge impact to your turnaround time. Because if the lab is a low throughput lab and you build your product to be running 96 samples in a, in a row, um, it actually means that the lab has to wait until they accumulate enough samples before they can start a run. So, so those are all consideration. And of course, if you build your test to be very, very near patient site, uh, where you actually don't need a lab, then it could be just a single test. It's a single user test. So, so that is the throughput that the system is part of the system that we are, we need to consider when we build, um, when we talk about diagnostics tests. And finally, is um, the analysis, the data analysis, and what type of, uh, uh, we call it the testing regime that you're talking about. So how do you analyze the data? Um, a lot of the tests today actually come with also a, a very um, specific software that would help the user better analyze um, the data. Um, and the regime of testing, whether you are doing a single test or you're doing um, you know, nowadays in the COVID pandemic where there's a lot of uh, literature talking about pool testing, um, just so that we are able to increase our throughput. Every test that we do, so for every test that we run, we're actually running five patient samples in one test. So that's what we meant by pool testing. So you, we also need to consider that sort of regime because um, if your test has been verified to have a certain performance, only uh, by doing one patient sample at a time. Now, if you want to run it in a pool testing um, format, you are actually looking at your test being able to test five different patient samples in one test. And that, that could have some implications to the performance of your test because um, there may be an increased uh, concentration of uh, certain uh, inhibit inhibitory factors to your essay. So those are all different things to consider. So every single element that you change in this whole um, you know, anatomy of the diagnostics test, you would have to add that as part of the consideration in your productization process. And you need to actually analytically verify that performance before you can state that your test is able to do that. So now that we understand what it means when we talk about diagnostics tests, uh, we can now look at um, what it means by productization. The first box in productization is uh, assay optimization. So although it says assay optimization, when we look at the optimization, we have to think about um, optimizing the whole system, not just optimizing the assay itself. Um, so if you, for example, if you have a PCR running on, um, you know, a certain instrument A, for example, then the optimization, that first box actually is to optimize your assay specifically on that instrument. And we need to, uh, very, very early on, if you look under optimization, it's not just to optimize for the technical performance, 
but it's also to optimize how well um, one can manufacture uh, this this product. So, in other words, when if you have, you know, if your reagents come in twenty different tubes, um, it does the same thing as if you are able to simplify the twenty tubes into ten tubes. And it gives you the same performance from a manufacturability perspective. Of course, ten tubes would be better because it's much easier to manufacture,、um, and it may actually bring the cost down.、Um, because in terms of logistics of manufacturing, you know, it is a, a little bit less uh, uh, manpower and resource uh, uh, constraint. So、uh, those are the different things when we talk about optimization. It's not just the technical performance. I think technical performance is 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 a、um, is the fundamental、uh, element that you need in order to make sure that everything that you change, you always come back to your technical performance to test that everything that you change downstream, you come back to double check that it has not changed your technical performance. So manufacturability is something that you do from、um, the beginning of the productization as part of optimization, and of course as you move along. Um, the productization workflow it、um, uh, takes you to the 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 really the deep end of what it means by manufacturing workflow. So we look at the whole entire bill of materials. We look at the whole entire、uh, manufacturing、uh, work instructions,、um, and these are the things that we do within DXD Hub for the purpose of、uh, helping our commercial partners accelerate their process. Because when we work with our commercial partners, it is not just for us to license the product; it's also for us to help them manufacture. The pilot production is very important as part of this process because, at the end of the day, you do need to make sure that the manufacturing, the production, will give you consistent、uh, performance. So you actually need to run through many batches of production. And we do that within DXD Hub to run through a few batches of pilot production, and we make sure that every single batch has the same performance. Because one of the one of the requirements for regulatory is actually, are you able to manufacture、um, consistent batches every time that we give you the same performance all the time? Normally, what we do is、uh, after the SA optimization, we would have a we would have a small. Uh, a small,、uh, almost preliminary run of analytical verification to help us build the protocol for、um, product development, and that helps us build the pilot production, the manufacturing workflow. And only after we are able to consistently produce different batches that would give you the same performance after the pilot production stage. Then we are ready to do the full-blown、um, analytical verification and clinical validation. So that's when we actually produce at least three different batches, and we run the analytical and clinical performance on those three batches.、Um, that would form the actual data that would need to go into your regulatory dossier. So this is really the the. You know the deep dive into the real nitty gritty of、uh, what it takes to do productization. So I think it's important to、um, uh, elaborate and deliberate this a little bit because、uh, one thing that we 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 deal with a lot when we deal with、um, our、uh, partners that are taking their、um, their IP their prototype to us and to want to work with us on a product. Um, the, I suppose one of the the biggest misconception when we talk about productization and product development is、um, people always forget about this part about production.、Um, they could have done everything else. They could have optimized the assay very very well.、Um, they could have done you know all the analytical protocols. They could have even taken the assay down to testing on clinical samples. Everything. But they miss out on the production,、um, and they,、uh, you know, they come to us and say, "Well, we've done everything else, but how do we actually manufacture that in a mass production、um, setting?" So、um, that would almost take us back to stage one, 
to start all over again, to redo the protocols so that we are able to build the manufacturing workflow into that. And so, so we do actually want to emphasize this point a little bit so that for, you know, those of us in the audience that are looking at doing product development for the first time, uh, keep that in mind. Um, of course, the, the downstream of productization and uh, uh, market deployment um, is really to a lot to do with uh, tech transferring that tech transferring that to our commercial partners, and a lot to do with uh, working directly with the end users. So going to the labs, going to the hospitals, talking to the clinicians, talking to the the, the lab managers, the lab operators, just getting some sense of. Uh, how the product is actually being used. Sometimes they'll come to us and say that our product has already been uh, verified and validated on machine A, but they don't have machine A. They have machine B that does the same function, but it's not the machine that we had validated. Um, it's very difficult to tell the lab to say, why don't you go buy one? Um, so what we do is actually, remember the agile process, so we actually do need to continuously iterate. We come back and we would then need to verify and validate the same assay but on, on, on a different platform. So on this slide you see that these are, uh, it's, it's a pretty comprehensive list of what it takes to build a regulatory dossier. I just want to actually maybe just focus on the three yellow boxes at the bottom. Um, things like the, uh, for example, the storage media compatibility. Um, this is actually not very obvious, but very important. Um, we very often um, hear feedback about some assays that are that are not working that well. Uh, in fact, when you look at their analytical performance on a piece of paper on the regulatory um, instruction for use, um, they, they all look really good. It's, it's, it's actually not possible to compare assays on paper. So you can't really take a different regulatory dossier um, of uh, different tests and compare them on paper and to say that this one is therefore better than the other one because this one has a lower limit of detection and that one has a higher sensitivity and so on. Because um, when you do, when you work on a product in an analytical setting, they are really based on um, performance um, with respect to a certain standard. And unless and until you know whether they are using the same standard, you can't really compare their performance uh, side by side. So normally the way to compare is the, actually in the clinical setting. When you're using the same set, the same cohort, the same clinical samples, and then you use them on different tests and you get some sense of whether one test is better than the other. Um, and even in that setting, it is very important that the users in the lab actually use the, the right collection media, for example. The other one is uh, whether you have actually tested the analytical performance of your test, of your assay um, in that system with respect to what kind of specimen, whether it is you know, blood or saliva. And even saliva, there are many different types of saliva. Saliva can be drooling saliva. Saliva also can be deep throat saliva. So you need to understand whether your assay has actually been proven to have the same performance in an analytical setting for the different types of specimen. And then of course the platform. So different PCR platform has different settings. So it is important for you to be able to have tested them in the lab and know exactly which setting to use so that you're able to better advise your users. And again, if you think about it from, if you think about product development from the market perspective, you always have to remember that you can't really dictate what your end users will use in terms of, a, let's say, a PCR machine. So you need to make sure that you give your end users as wide a choice as possible in terms of whatever that they already have, your essay is able to work on their system. This um, slide actually shows the difference between Resolute 2.0 and a conventional um, a PCR test. So Resolute 2.0 is a direct PCR test. Uh, what that means is um, um, it, it, it is a PCR where um, you don't need to do 
an additional step of、uh, sample prep. So there's absolutely no RNA extraction. You take the specimen directly、um, from collection point, and then you put it in the PCR master mix, and then PCR.、Um, so that can so that is、uh, what Resolute is on the top of the slide.、Um, So you go from、uh, sample collection, whether it is、uh, specifically for for Resolute 2.0, it is applicable to whether it is nasal swab, whether it is、uh, throat swab or nasal pharyngeal swab.、Um, so Resolute 2.0 is a COVID-19、um, uh, RT-PCR test. It's a direct RT-PCR test for COVID-19.、Um, so if you start from the first box of the workflow on the top. We are looking at special, uh, uh, sample specimens that are either nasal, nasal pharyngeal, or throat, and then of course a certain transport media. And we have tested Resolute 2.0 in a, a number of、uh, uh, very, very specific brand and type of、uh, collection media,、um, and it's all stated so that the users are aware、uh, which are the ones that have been validated. So if they are not using any of the ones that have been validated and listed, then、um, the assay may or may not、um, perform as well as what we had stated. And the, where the dotted line is basically is where the lab process starts. So at the lab, basically what you do is、um, you just add five microliter of the sample directly into a master mix, and you. Start the PCR reaction, and the whole process should not take more than one and a half hours. The PCR itself actually takes sixty minutes. So we are saying that you know the taking the five microliter of the the patient specimen into the PCR well, depending on how many you do. If you do the whole ninety six well,、um, it could take about fifteen minutes. So all the way from the sample arriving to the lab,、um, an operator starting to work on the sample. To the finish of the PCR, to the result, the report coming out is maybe about one and a half,、um, probably not more than one and a half hours. So that's the whole workflow of uh, uh, Resolute 2.0. Compare that with the bottom of the slide, a conventional conventional RT PCR. Basically, the workflow before lab is the same. You、um, take the swab and then you use a certain collection media. The difference actually is what happens in the lab when the when the sample arrives in the lab. For a conventional RT PCR, you actually need to run、um, RNA extraction. The RNA extraction here we put down one and a half hours.、Um, so the one and a half hours actually refers to labs that actually have uh, uh, an RNA extraction system that would be able to run ninety six sample.、Um, uh, You know, at the same time. So this is actually in the context of running 96 well PCR. So if you're trying to do a 96 well PCR, then if you are a lab that is equipped with um, um, uh, RNA extraction that is able to do 96 in a row, then yes, it would take about one and a half hours. But if not, if you're using, you know, worse, if you're using a manual system, you would be doing that one at a time. It could take multiple hours.、Um, even some of the other、um, system that are able to do higher throughput,、um, uh, but not 96. What that means is, in order for you to run a 96 well PCR、um, run, you would have to wait for the RNA extraction to finish. So, if your RNA extraction cycle can only do 14 in a row, you have to wait about. I don't know seven hours before you can batch enough to run one plate. So what that means is in that in that system it would take you about nine hours to do one plate of ninety six, versus one and a half hours to do the same plate of ninety six. Just the lab process itself, there's a wide range for conventional RT PCR of three to six hours, depending on the RNA extraction system you use in the lab. Even if you have a 96 uh, sample uh, RNA extraction system, it would take you double the time of、uh, direct PCR like Resolute 2.0. At the end of the day, we are talking about the turnaround time, and the turnaround time is not just 
having an essay that can run a test very quickly, but it is also about having an essay that may not need to be very very quick, but you can do ninety six uh, in a row. Um, so all that actually uh, would be uh, part of the consideration when we're talking about how do we increase the throughput. Resolute two point oh is actually a process of iterative improvement. We started Resolute two point oh from Resolute one point oh. So so that's what actually this slide is showing the the progress of how we continue to improve as a result of um, feedback from users. And then we come back from the end to end. So we, we, we went to the end users, we came back and we iterate and we improve. And then we went back uh, with an improved product as a result of that. So if you look at the progression of uh, what we have done using this, uh, what we call accelerated productization process, um, it's taken us um, uh, really only from April to July to roll out um, three different uh, uh, format of the same test. So we started with the Resolute 1.0, um, where it basically does very much similar things, um, but in a slightly different format. Um, so the essay is slightly different, the system is slightly different, and if you look at Resolute 1, it's got 14 tubes in terms of the reagents, and of course, we very, very quickly came back and with an improved version, you know, through that iterative process of Resolute 2, where it is now only four tubes. Also made some uh, changes in the way that the essay you know, was done, um, uh, added differences in the how the system is done. And very, very recently in July, what we have added was automation. Um, automation to basically, remember, uh, you remember the, the chart where we talked about when the when the sample arrives in the lab, uh, somebody has to uh, actually allocate the sample into the PCR mix. Uh, so that part is uh, still quite manual. Um, that part, somebody actually needs to uncap the UTM tube, allocate into the 96 well plate, and then cap the UTM tube. We actually now have an automation uh, solution. Sample prep for Resolute 2 literally is uh, allocating. So the automation allows us to do that. So we uh, now are able to cut down even on the, um, the the human errors. So we don't need to have someone that is in full PPE standing in front of the biosafety cabinet doing uh, allocating for many hours in a row. So this actually shows um, um, a, a very nice picture of uh, uh, the process as a result of the process that we have developed in DXT Hub to be able to very quickly um, go through um, not just to make the first product, but also to iterate and to make to continue to make improvement, to push out pipeline product um, in response to the feedback from the customers. After introducing Resolute 2.0, I have to introduce the teams that are responsible for re developing Resolute 2.0. It was uh, developed together by three teams, mainly the teams at DSO, Defense Science Organization, DXC Hub, and our colleague at ARTC ASTAR. So the um, ARTC ASTAR team um, was responsible for developing the automation to run the, the sample prep for Resolute 2.0. And the DxO team was led by Dr. Tan Bun Huan. Um, DxC Hub team was led by Dr. Uh, Wang Rayfen. And the ARTC A-Star team was led by Dr. David Low. So I want to take this opportunity to, um, to maybe highlight the, 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 uh, a very, very fundamental uh, element which I didn't talk about throughout the whole presentation uh, was the fact that for any of this to be possible, I always like to tell people that the success of a diagnostics test really is dependent on how well you work with your partners because of the iterative process that's required for you to keep improving your products so that you are able to keep having a um, um, uh, a successful market deployment and market adoption of your test. I hope that short presentation has given you uh, some understanding or better understanding of what it takes to build a diagnostics test.
Thank you.